maybe Ali joining us. Um, I'm Zandra Beccarina from the New Zealand Down Syndrome Association and I'm the Executive Officer and I'd like to just um, introduce you to Sarah who will tell you a little bit more about herself from Upside Downs who's co-hosting with me today. I'll hand over to you Sarah. Thank you. Tina kwe, tina yahi yahi. I'm Sarah, as um, Sandra said, and I'm uh, in charge of Upside Downs, sort of. Um, we provide speech therapy for children with Down syndrome, and many of you are members here this evening, which is awesome. Um, as we've discussed, the, the meeting will be recorded. Um, obviously, there's quite a few people in attendance, but there's actually a lot of people who have expressed to us in advance that they can't come and they're really keen to see the recording. So, um, yeah, to, to our as yet invisible audience, no my hi my. And uh, yeah, you will all, um, everyone who's an NZDSA member and an Upside Downs member will be sent the links to the recordings. Uh, if you're not either one of those two things, um, sign up. And yeah, just a, another heads up about a, a webinar coming up on the 19th of October that uh, Zandra and I will be joining forces on again um, about speech and language therapy, which is a, a, a continuation of one that we did um, a few weeks ago. So webinars ahoy. Um, yeah, I think that is all from me. Um, I'll be moderating your questions. So if you have, um, we've, we've had a few questions sent to us in advance from people who couldn't make it, but any questions that you have at any stage, just pop them in the chat. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get to as many of them as possible. Um, you don't have to wait until the Q&A section. If something kind of hits you while one of the presenters is talking, do feel free just to chuck it in there um, and I'll be monitoring those. So yeah, thank you very much all for coming. Kia ora. Thank you, Sarah. And just so that everyone knows the format of this evening, we're going to start with um, in just introductions of all our wonderful guest speakers and just to say thank you to all of them for being here and available to share the information with us. Um, we'll start with Dr. Rosemary Marks, who will do her presentation um, and then move on to Alexia and then um, on to Bev and then we'll do the Q&A and then we'll just wind up and I just wanted to share some news about what's happening in October as well at the NZDSA. So, um, Rosemary, could I please ask you to introduce yourself? Thank you, Sandra. Tēnā kūtu, tēnā kūtu, tēnā kūtu katoa, ko Rosemary Marks aho. Most people call me Rosie. Um, I am a trying to be totally retired developmental paediatrician, but I'm not very good at it. Retiring, that is not be developmental <laughs> paediatrics. I'll hand over to Marguerite to introduce herself. Yura, I'm Marguerite Dalton. I am a not yet retired developmental paediatrician. Um, I uh, work mostly in the South Auckland, uh, but also work for the Immunisation Advisory Centre, uh, largely in their well child area, but also obviously advising about immunisations. And I'm going to hand over to Alexia now. Tēnā koutou uh, katoa, um, ko Alexia toku ingwa. Um, I am based in Te Wakairangi, uh, Lower Hutt, and I've worked with people with learning disability for about 21 years now. Um, I have spent a long time with the uh, Disabled Persons Organisation People First New Zealand, um, and five years assisting Sir Robert Martin on the United Nations Committee for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and his very important role there. Um, and I have just finished a um, contract with Capital and Coast District Health Board as lead advisor on the vaccination program um, talk, uh, from the Disability Strategy Unit. So yeah, kia ora everybody, nice to meet you all. Bev? You're on mute. Bev, you're Sorry, on mute. Bev, you're on mute. Yeah, I thought you had to do that. Sorry. Um, so I am um, a mum of a, of a daughter with Down syndrome who's a young woman, and I am a um, public health nurse. Um, and that includes being a vaccinator and a tester for COVID-19. So quite a lot of experience with that. Um, my daughter has 
a very strong needle phobia, but she's had both her vaccines, which was really cool. My colleagues were very supportive of that. And um, we live in Te Taitaukaro, Northland, and we have con constantly <laughs> been working on COVID stuff since the beginning of last year when it all broke out. So we started with testing and now we've been vaccinating since um, the last day of February. And it's a range of um, big community events, drive-throughs, um, home visits, school visits, all sorts. And I have um, been coordinating and part of working with uh, people with disabilities and vaccinating them both through drive through and at, at the school um, and at their uh, idea services offices. It's gone really, really well. So um, we've been really, really pleased with how it's all gone so far. Now with the younger kids coming in, that will bring a whole new ball game for us. And we're wondering um, if we may be doing school, school visits as well later on. So um, that's... That's where I come from. Um, regarding hesitancy with kids, I think it's really important that parents are honest with them as much as possible, but not make a big fuss. You know, it's just, this is what we do. Um, demonstrating by having their own vaccines, maybe at the same time. Um, and thinking about what venues that is going to suit your particular child or family member uh, for their needs. Like it may be a drive-through work fine, it might be that they need to go to their own GP. It might be that they would prefer to go to the chemist because that's quicker, just, just what suits best. Um, and of course, the vaccinators have the um, consent of parents. However, if the child or young person refuses that, they have the right to do that as well. So that requires thinking about as well. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, people have as we go on. Okay. Thank you. So, so we'll hand over to um, Dr. Marks to do her presentation for us and give us an overview. I just want to add, if you missed the last presentation, we went into quite a lot of detail. That link is available. And so if you're not getting our newsletter, we have shared that with everybody. But if you're not getting it, it will be on our website and you'll be able to, act. well, it is on our website. Under COVID information, you'd be able to see the um, presentation we did previously. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Zandra. You should now be able to see my screen. Um, and I shall plunge straight into it. You've seen the disclaimer if you looked at your email that we're going to try and answer the questions, but we don't have all the answers, just the same as the government doesn't have all the answers. And we're certainly not here to judge anybody about whatever decision they make in relation to vaccination. This was the summary slide from the first talk I did, which was now a few weeks ago. And I've not, I'm not going to talk about consent tonight because we want to have plenty of time for questions. I'm just going to run through the other, other issues uh, quickly. I'm just going to remind people what a pandemic is. So we have a number of words that you will hear use. One is endemic. That doesn't apply to COVID. It's the level of disease that's usually present in a particular geographical area. And you've all heard about respiratory syncytial virus recently. That's endemic in New Zealand. We've had an outbreak this year, partly because we were locked down last year. We're now talking about an outbreak, which is a local increase in the disease. So all of us in Auckland have the pleasure of being locked down for a bit longer. Um, and then a pandemic is widespread disease affecting many countries. And over the years going back to, you know, records go back to um, about 40 AD, there have been many, many pandemics. I'm sure for some of you, this will be um, teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, but bear with me. So we are all made up of tiny building blocks called cells, which make up all living things. And the important thing is they contain a nucleus, which has the plan for everything the animal or plant needs to do. And then they have some other bits and pieces, which I'm not going to go into. So what's a virus? Uh, and one of the reasons I 
in the first talk I gave, I talked about what is a virus because I discovered that people who I thought would know didn't really understand what a virus is. So basically, it's a tiny, tiny little box which contains the plan, the genetic code to make copies of itself. It doesn't have all those other bits that a cell has. It's not a cell and it can't function by itself. It's not a bacteria like the bugs that cause illnesses like food poisoning and TB. And this is the really important message. It can only multiply when it is inside a cell of a living organism. And that's why we're having a pandemic because we have allowed it to infect a lot of living organisms called people. So a coronavirus is a kind of virus which has something called RNA. So you've probably heard of DNA, you know, the ad, it's in our DNA, you know, it's in our DNA. RNA is, takes the message from the DNA to the other parts of the cell to make the proteins that make the virus, okay? It's in the coronavirus group, and as you see from that pretty picture, um, it has spikes, and it looks like a crown. There are actually a lot of viruses in this family, and some of them are relatively benign and are known human coronaviruses. This one's called the SARS, was originally called the SARS-CoV-2 virus particle. That means severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. And the reason it was 2 was because the original SARS um, epidemic back in, I think it was about 2003, um, was also called SARS. So it distinguishes it from SARS. Now it's tiny, 50 to 140 nanometers. That's about 3,000 times smaller than a grain of salt. So you can't see it. So let's move on to vaccines. That's obviously what you're all here to talk about. So when we get an infection, a common cold, a flu, an infected finger from with a staph, we produce proteins called antibodies in response to that infection. And those antibodies neutralize the infection. Now, a vaccine is designed to produce antibodies to a specific serious infection. There are a number of different types. I'm not going to go into them. The um, main type for the COVID vaccines is the mRNA, va mRNA vaccines. There are also some viral vector vaccines, but that doesn't apply in New Zealand. They're not in use in New Zealand. Why would we vaccinate? Well, most of you are probably aware of the reasons why we're vaccin vaccinating. People are 17 times more likely to die from COVID, one seven times more likely to die from COVID than from seasonal flu. And every year in New Zealand, we get about 500 people die from seasonal influenza. So if COVID became endemic in New Zealand, in other words, it was in the background of the population all the time and we didn't have immunity, we'd expect that about 8,500 people would die from COVID each year. We also think, well, not me personally, but experts are now predicting that the global pandemic will last between three and five years, and it may last longer, particularly as it changes and mutates. And as we've learned, had really clearly um, demonstrated to us over recent weeks, the new strains are a major hazard because they are becoming more effective at infecting people. So what about the impact of um, COVID-19 in people with disability? So there was some data from England uh, last year um, covering about an 11 month, 10 month period, which demonstrated that of the total COVID related deaths in England, and that was the ones they counted, but they're much better at counting than some other countries. There were over 50,000. Of those, 30,000 had some degree of disability. So that's nearly two thirds of the people who died in England had some degree of disability. Severe disability, and this appears to have been mainly severe intellectual disability, was 15,000. That's about a third, what three out of 10 of every people, person, 
three out of 10 of the people who died in the UK had a severe disability. So it's very worrying. In terms of the impact in Down syndrome, um, if you Google COVID-19 infection and Down syndrome, you'll get over 100,000 results. So it's good that people are actually looking at the research in this area. The people with Down syndrome who get COVID are generally younger than people in the general population getting COVID, and they're also sicker. Although we've seen with Delta that it's actually younger people who are getting COVID. Interestingly, one report of two cases noted that both had hypothyroidism um, in association, which was noted when they came into hospital with their COVID. And so I think that emphasizes the importance of particularly if you have a young adult with uh, Down syndrome of making sure their thyroid function tests get checked because I suspect when uh, children leave pediatric care it may not happen as regularly. So there was a group in Oxford who looked at the um, data on people with disability and the general population and they found for people with Down syndrome there was a fourfold increased risk for COVID-19 related hospitalization. In other words, you were four times more likely to get admitted to hospital. And sadly, a tenfold increased risk of death in COVID-19. So I don't want to scare you guys, but I do think it is important that you are aware of this. And obviously there are some people who are very worried about, you know, what to do if their person with Down syndrome can't have COVID vaccine for any reason. So the vaccine that New Zealand is using is called the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. It also has some other names, but most people just call it the Pfizer vaccine. When you get your little card, when you get vaccinated, she said ripping her little card out of her wallet. When you get your little card, it actually says on it, uh, Cominati which is, um, means it's an RNA vaccine. What's probably important to people is what is in this vaccine. So the active ingredient is a modified RNA, which encodes for those little spikes that you saw in the picture. And they are necessary before the virus can get into a cell and cause problems. It's in a little fatty envelope. Um, and it has a few other things and a bit, a bit of salt to keep the vaccine at the correct acidity level, but it doesn't have any preservatives. It doesn't have any mercury or any of those other chemicals that people worry about being added to vaccines. If you want to know exactly what's in it, if you go to the MedSafe website and look up the data sheet on about page eight of or 20 of the 30 page data sheet, you will find all the components listed. And it's important to remember that several of the vaccines have more than one name. So um, if you hear about people having had other vaccines, they are not the same. So what are the side effects? Well, the common things are pain, swelling or redness at the injection site. You may even get a bruise. I did. I'm sure if Bev had given me my um, COVID vaccine, I, I wouldn't have got a bruise, would I, Bev? Absolutely not. Some people feel a bit tired or weary after the injection. Some people have some headache, muscle pains, joint pains, fever. They're relatively common, probably about one in three people who have the vaccine. There are some uncommon side effects. One of the ones that interested me was that in the clinical trials, less than one in a hundred people reported side effects such as feeling unwell and itching at the injection site. I would have thought that would be more common. Uh, and there is a handout which has all these links in a Word document if you want to click on them so that you'll have access to them. Is it safe? My view is it's safer than crossing an Auckland road. It's quite safe crossing Auckland roads at the moment because there isn't any traffic, but in a regular Auckland year, um, probably about uh, 10 people die on our roads crossing the road each year. Um, so this is definitely safer. Um, this give you the link is, is here. Each DHB will have a link. This is the Northern Region link 
of where to get vaccinated. And when I when I put this presentation together, you'll see I had the Elliott rooms, level four, the atrium building. They've now been closed down because of the proximity to the uh, hotel in question. Um, but there are now a lot of vaccination sites, as Bev pointed out. Does this work? Um, I think we had some new evidence tonight on the news when they said that of the um, people in the current outbreak, something like only um, a, a very small percentage have actually been had any vaccine and an even smaller percentage have had, had um, are fully vaccinated. So yes, you can still get coronavirus when you've been vaccinated. But nearly all the deaths in the US, and this is data from May of this year, when they had 853,000 hospitalizations with COVID-19, which are figures that make us go, oh, that's an awful lot. However, in fully vaccinated people, fewer than 1,200. And that's about 0.1% of the people admitted were had been vaccinated. So that's encouraging. Now, what about the Delta strain, which is what we're really worried about at the moment? So there's been some work done on the effectiveness of COVID against the Delta strain. If you had had one dose of vaccine, and now this is comparing Pfizer with what they call Chadox, N, Ch Chadox 1N COVID-19. This is the Oxford vaccine, um, or also known as AstraZeneca. One dose, much lower, only 30% cover than people who had the alpha variant, which was the original one. However, once you've had two doses, if the um, it's about 90, it's about 88% among those with the Delta variant. So you may still get infected, but it's much better at um, inhibiting Delta than it is against. Uh, than AstraZeneca is. So that's good. Just some quick questions before we go to all your questions. So um, I think it's important for you to know this. If your son or daughter or you have a reaction, then if it's a severe reaction, you should get urgent medical help. You should consult your doctor, but don't leave a message on the answer phone. Get help straight away. And it's important to report reactions to the Center for Adverse Reactions to Medication. And so that is from their website. And I think you can see that uh, one place for health professionals, uh, one for um, COVID-19 adverse reactions, but also a, 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 a tab that you can click on if you are a consumer or a patient. So you don't have to wait for your doctor who's busy to do the paperwork. People ask, the, the vaccine was developed quickly, is it safe? And the answer is it is. There's been a very concerted effort to develop several vaccines. There's been extensive testing and now many, many millions of people worldwide have had this vaccine. And the approval processes were run together rather than separately to speed up the process. I think you probably know the answer for all, to these questions from seeing the news, but yes, there will be enough vaccine for everyone. There may be a little hiccup in delivery, but to be honest, we are so much better off here than people in other parts of the world. And I'll come back to that later. Um, so now everyone over 12 can have a vaccine, including non-residents and overstayers. We don't want anybody in our community spreading the virus because they can't get vaccine because of their immigration status. And they have been told that their information will be kept confidential. So immigration, they better stick with that. Um, we can talk about the under 12s later, but there are trials going on at the moment. Scared of needles, Bev's going to talk about that. Offering a reward may be helpful. This was my son's reward, um, a little purple sticker. Um, I was very disapproving of the place where he took the photo, which is the railway overbridge at Middlemore Hospital. He doesn't work there anymore, I'm pleased to say. I'm sorry, Marguerite, I shouldn't have said that. Um, but 
I think North Shore is slightly safer. Oh, thank you for my cup of tea. Um, and this is from the UK, uh, and I've just highlighted the bit about Down syndrome. So the jo Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation has recommended that people with young people with certain conditions, including Down syndrome, should be prioritised for vaccination. The last thing I want to say is this virus can't mutate, change to a new strain if it's not in a human host. And new strains are going to continue to emerge until, until if, as long as there is people with active infection anywhere in the world. So we're not safe until everyone is safe. And the rich countries are all, including us, are all jumping on the bandwagon. But as long as there are remote areas of the world in poorer countries who can't get vaccine, we're not safe. Um, there is some talk of an annual booster. There seems to be a bit of thought that maybe boosters might not be so important now, but we don't know. So it's something to be prepared for. I had to put this in. We are a haiku. We isolate now, so when we gather again, no one is missing, and that's what we want. And just a little reminder to all you parents, do put on your own oxygen mask first, look after your own well-being uh, before uh, helping others. So I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to the Q&A. Oh, I think just before we go to Q&A, Rosemary, we're going to ask Alexia just to um, chat to us a little bit about supported decision-making. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary. And um, that was a really interesting, interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sandra. So as I, um, I'm just going to set my wee timer here because we've got, what, 10 minutes? Thereabouts? <laughs> um, so I just thought I'd start off by talking a little bit about what we were doing um, in Capital Coast District Health Board um, Disability Strategy Team. Um, my role was to both support the work that that awesome team is doing in terms of their disability rollout of the vaccine, um, but also support the disability leads from the other DHBs all around the country with their rollout. And um, as you will appreciate, all the DHBs uh, rolling things out at a different speed and um, to different, uh, how can I say this, different levels of efficiency, um, but everybody is trying. Um, and it is, you know, if you have any bad experiences with the vaccination system, please do speak up about them because that's the only way that they are going to know um, what is not working and how to make things better. Um, and I will cross my fingers for you all that you will be heard. Um, within the DHB, uh, supported decision-making and informed consent was a really um, big issue. Um, and one that it didn't seem like had been really thought about in the fullness of what it really means. Um, and that's not just for that DHB, that's Ministry of Health, that's all across the country that I saw that. Um, supported decision-making, is a term that we're still learning, uh, as, a, as a practice, we're still learning. Um, and to be honest, is not really done very well um, anywhere in the world yet um, on a systemic um, basis. So in my role with um, Sir Robert Martin on the UN committee, we have I have the privilege of being able to um, see the committee question lots of different countries around the world about um, lots of different implementation of, of human rights for disabled people, but supported decision-making is the, and the right to um, legally make your own choices uh, is the most contested right um, in the entire convention because countries are really scared of it and they're scared of what it means. And people are really scared about giving disabled people the right to make legal choices for themselves. Um, so it's, it's, the, it's the most contentious uh, right. And so there are a lot of people who, who talk the talk, but don't really want to do the mahi and don't really um, want to take the time that supported decision-making does take. Because um, supported decision-making does take a lot of time and energy and patience 
uh, and creativity and thinking outside the box. And um, I still think that we uh, don't know the best ways of doing it, but we need to keep continuously working on them and creating new, new things and taking a lead from the disabled people in our lives about what works best for them. So I assume you all kind of are familiar with um, uh, what the opposite of supportive decision making is, which is usually other people making decisions for disabled people. So um, in the UN Convention and, and other places, that's talked about as substitute decision making, where um, you, either family or um, services or doctors or advocates, um, like appointed advocates, make decisions in the best interests of um, the person with disability. And we know that this is a practice that is um, problematic in terms of human rights. Uh, it has been abused a lot uh, around the world. Um, it's very rarely reviewed as often as it's supposed to be and is often applied to people who could actually make decisions for themselves. Um, but it is just easier and faster. Now that's not to say that I'm judging any families uh, who do have welfare guardianship for their son or daughter. Um, I have not walked in your shoes and um, I know that you do so out of the, you know, all the love in your heart for your child. Um, but in terms of a wider human rights framework, um, it's, not the, it's not the direction that we want to go as a country or as a world. Uh, New Zealand ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2008, which means that it is um, the role of our government to change our laws in New Zealand so that we are in line with the convention. And the right to make your own legal choices for yourself, uh, the right to equality before the law is what it's called, is a really big part of that. And you may be wondering, all right, so we give people all you know, the right to make their own legal choices for themselves, but my son or daughter can't do that. So it sounds good, but how is, how is that actually going to work in practice? And like I said before, it's not easy. Um, people with disabilities, as you know, are incredibly diverse. So you have uh, you know, people who are absolutely able to make their own decisions for themselves, understand you know, um, standard information that is given to them and weigh up the pros and cons, talk to the people around them, make their own decisions like the rest of us. Um, and then you have people down the other end of the, the scheme who uh, don't communicate in ways that people understand. Um, and it would be very hard to have a conversation about a a complex issue, let alone even day-to-day -day issues sometimes. So then it can be really, really hard to think, well, how could I have a, have a really hard conversation about vaccination and whether or not they consent um, when I can't even get a, a, an answer as to whether or not um, they're happy today, you know? So it's, it's, you've got a really big, huge diversity in the disability community. And so no one size is gonna fit everybody. And saying that, you kind of have to be an optimist if you're going to be um, promoting supportive decision making, because um, we know in terms of human rights that it's the way to go, but they haven't given us the answers on how to do it. So we still have to come up with the best ways of making it happen, and we do have to be really creative. Um, I'm just going to use that word, that phrase that I hate the most, which is challenging behaviour. And, and so that phrase follows disabled people. If they get it in their file, it follow, follows them for life. Um, I, I'm sure, have challenging behaviours. And um, I'm, I have the luxury as a, a person without learning disability to be able to have challenging behaviours and not have that follow me through my life. Um, but for many of our whānau, that is not the case. Um, behaviour is communication. And if somebody doesn't communicate verbally, 
they communicate in other ways. There are very, very, very few people in the world who you would not be able to tell if they are happy or sad based on body language, responses, noises, any other way that they communicate, um, whether that's uh, socially acceptable responses or not. Um, so there are ways that people can communicate and it's, and it's on us to um, learn that, that communication style and come to the party uh, instead of asking the disabled people to always um, be the ones explaining in a way that we can understand. So supportive decision making is about changing the way we do things. It's about um, having accessible information, alternative formats of information. So, um, you know, easy read, uh, sign language, braille, um, MP3 formats, whatever works for people. I'm a big proponent of easy read. I know it doesn't work for everybody, um, but it is, it is there as both a um, something for a person to be able to uh, read themselves, but also there is a facilitation tool to the people in their lives to be able to know how to explain things easy in an easy way to the person with disability that they're supporting. So it's not just there as, you know, well, this disabled person can or can't read, so it's going to be useful for them or not. It's also a tool for the people around them so that they can um, know how to explain things in a really easy way and give context to people. So easy read, I love easy read. Um, other supported decision making tools that are out there, you know, um, there's circles of support, um, there's giving people more time and space to make the um, decisions that they want to. Um, there's loads of websites actually. Uh, if you go to the Auckland Disability Law website, they ran a hoey a few years back on supportive decision making and they've got a load of tools there um, listed on their website that you can have a look at. And I've got a bunch of links actually that I can provide to Sandra um, for sharing afterwards. Um, but I think the best supportive decision making stuff is what works for your family and what works for the person that you know. So just because it's not listed on a, on a website, if it works for you and your family, then that's what you should do. Um, and I think a lot of the, you know, learnings and creativity for supportive decision making is yet to come. So what we're talking about now is going to be very different from in 10 years time. I was going to just also just reinforce uh, the UN convention with... Um, you may or may not have heard of them, but there's an international alliance called the International Disability Alliance, IDA. And they've made a statement um, about COVID-19 vaccination. You saw the, um, some of the statistics in Rosemary's talk. And um, a big part of those statistics is that um, disabled people around the world are more likely to be in large group homes and residential institutions. And just like um, rotavirus, when a virus gets into those places, um, that just, it rips through them. And so we've seen a lot of the, the casualties from the disabled population have come from those places. And I just thought I'd just make, uh, share a little bit from their statement. They said, receiving a COVID-19 vaccination must be based on free and informed consent of persons with disabilities. Autonomy and legal capacity of all persons with disabilities, including persons with intellectual disabilities, persons with psychosocial disabilities and autistic persons, must not be undermined with justifications such as the public good or the best interest of the person. So the whole world is, is saying the same thing, but in practice, um, we've still got to kind of share with each other um, all the different tricks and tips that we've we've discovered along the way because um, it's still an emerging practice. Supported decision making is not well known and not well practiced. But I want to encourage everybody to give it a go um, because um, just because things have been done a, a different way or forever doesn't mean that that's the best way of doing things. So um, I've gone over, so I'll just, I'll leave it there.
Thank you so much, Alexia. I think you've given us a lot of um, food for thought around that topic. Um, just to say, you can head to the People First website and you'll find all some, some tools that you can use. And as Alexia said, um, other links that you'll send to us. So we can send those to you as well and will all be available on our website as well. So I think I might hand over at this stage to Sarah to ask um, Bev the very first question um, that we've sort of had. <laughs> Thanks so much, Zena. And um, yes, this first question is definitely for you, Bev. Um, so somebody has asked, very keen to hear strategies for my daughter who has needle phobia and all things medical phobia. Uh, usually they have to have uh, normal procedures carried out under sedation or general anesthetic. So what is your advice, tips, tricks for that situation? Okay. Um, well, we... We, I can tell you that we have actually vaccinated quite a few people with that kind of um, scenario that have generally had to be sedated. We've, we've done ones that have had to be sedated for other um, childhood vaccinations. The beauty about the COVID vaccine from a vaccinator's point of view, um, a person being vaccinated and families, is that it's a very quick, small vaccine, tiny amount, 0.3 of a mil. So it's, and it's very quick once it, it, you're in and it's out, you know. So that's a good thing for families to realise. Um, any parents that have had their vaccine will realise that. Um, I think, so we, we've had people come to, as I say, various different sites. If, if families are able to find or figure out the best site for them um, where they're child, young person will, or person with a disability, I mean, they're any age, feels really familiar and comfortable. Um, however, some, some of our um, clients have felt really comfortable coming in the van with other people from their own, like this is residential people, came and they were with their um, household people and they were really happy. And some of them were really needle phobic, but it was an outing and they were quite happy with that. Um, so I think it's not making a big fuss not worrying that you're going to need an anaesthetic. It's, a, as I say, it's over in seconds. <laughs> um, just preparing, but not making a huge big deal. No, it's, this is what we're going to do today. And, you know, um, bottom line, if the kid or young person or person with disability of whatever age says no and absolutely pushes away, there's no way anybody's going to force them. Um, uh, other things you can think about perhaps are, are some sort of little treat or um, or reward, but I think families, people need to be a little bit cautious about that because it can be an expectation for every time you have anything done. Um, yeah, if, if, um, if a person with anybody that comes to a big site is not likely to going to have um, time to have Emla or any of those creams that numb the skin first. Um, so, you know, think about if they're going to go to a drive through, it's not going to happen. It's going to be quick and fast and, and there we, you're on your way sort of thing after the 15 minutes wait afterwards. But if, if you really believe that your um, person with the disability is going to require um, that sort of thing, you'd need to make an appointment with the GP to have that done. Um, what else can I suggest? You know, I, I, I believe in always being as honest as possible, but you don't have to go into great lengths. And I, having had a long time of vaccinating children of all ages and abilities and disabilities at schools, we find that the less fuss and drama that goes into it, the better. And most of the, say, shall I say, children that we vaccinate at school who don't have disabilities, who are needle phobic, They've learned that. They don't board needle phobic. So it's either that they've had a lot of needles in their life, which are unfortunately a lot of our children with Down syndrome have had, like my daughter, so that's put her off. But other, other ones, they've got it from the parents. So if parents are anxious mm -hmm. and worried mm -hmm. and excited, the kids will be too, or that, you know, their, their um, family member will be as well. So be calm, be positive. If, if you can't be, then they, they could go with, another family member like auntie or just dad or you know just really plan it but in a gentle non-fuss way I hope that's helpful um 
But yeah, we, we have certainly have vaccinated people who have previously had to be um, sedated and it's not been a problem. As I say, it's quick. Right. It's not painless. I would never say that. I'm, I'm totally honest as a vaccinator. I won't say, you know, people say it's going to hurt. Yep, it's a little prick, but it's over quickly. And I find I distract people quite well by talking too much um, <laughs> and asking them questions about themselves and their day. And they don't even realise they've had it half the time. Yeah. yeah. That's helpful. Just check as well, that just check with your district health board as well because there are more accessible sites um, that you can go to as well that are low sensory and there's bigger time space. So when you book that appointment as well and you need extra support, just remember to let people know because then they'll work around that as well. Um, and you can always get the Imla cream at your pharmacy as well if you're going to do the drive and apply it beforehand. So I think I'll hand back to Sarah for more Q&As. Yeah, I think Rosemary might have had something to add, though, quickly. Oh, well, Bev covered it. I was just going to say it's really important that the people around the person are calm and mm. show calm behaviour. And if they are anxious themselves, they just need to hide it. Um, and from years of working in paediatrics, and I'm sure Marguerite will confirm this, when you have a hyped up parent, you get a hyped up child. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, we had quite a lot of questions um, come to Upside Downs uh, in advance of the session um, about the risks of the vaccine for children with Down syndrome who also have a heart condition. Um, it's obviously a relatively high incidence of that. Uh, so for example, AVSD, uh, those who've had heart surgery as an infant. Um, yeah, so is, is there a heightened risk uh, with the vaccine for people who come under that category? Marguerite, do you want to answer that? I thought you were going to give that one to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I did send out to Zandra earlier on today the um, information that mm. came out through IMAX. Zandra, I don't know if you got that, um, and you would like to sort of um, pass that on to everybody. Um, there is evidence that there's a slight increased risk, or there is a risk of heart inflammation, so were myocarditis, pericarditis, of some people who've received the COVID vaccine. And it's particularly thought to be in young males under the age of 30 after the second vaccine dose. However, it's um, still at such a level that the overwhelming benefits of the vaccine um, would, um, you know, would outweigh any of that risk. In terms of is there a higher risk for people with a congenital heart disease? I have searched so far, and to be honest, the answer to that is I haven't found anything yet. I don't know that um, data is that specific, to be honest. I've put out the question to my researchers and nobody's come back yet with anything specific. I think the other uh, issue with this would be Congenital heart disease, um, and you can support me here, Rosie, is obviously a very broad term. And so it would vary from somebody who's got just a little small hole um, to somebody whose plumbing is completely the wrong way round. And um, I think those are two very different um, scenarios. So my advice is um, the, the benefits of the vaccine are still outweigh any of these possible risks. Um, and I guess possibly again, Rosie, I don't know what you think, whether people should, if they're really concerned, perhaps be talking to their cardiologists, if that's um, you know, um, a, a specific patient-related, person-related issue. Yeah, yes, in the case of um, people who have a, had a congenital heart problem, um, they should be, if, if it's of any significance, they should be under follow-up by the uh, congenital, adult congenital cardiac team. Um, one of the things to mention here, of course, is that we now understand that COVID-19 in some people causes myocarditis and in some people causes pericarditis. Um, so, you know, we don't know whether the risk is actually more in, you know, whether this vaccination risk is actually very, very low. 
uh, but we know the wild virus causes this, so perhaps it's not surprising. Yeah, again, it's like a lot of, with a lot of the vaccines and a lot of the reactions, as you say, the, um, the disease can cause major problems, mm -hmm. whereas, yeah, much more severe. Thank you. So just a follow up question to that, I suppose, um, you know, accepting that that risk is, is going to be much higher for if you catch COVID than if you get the vaccine. Um, obviously, it is still a risk. So um, what are the symptoms of myocarditis or pericarditis um, that people should be looking out for, particularly if they're concerned of that higher, slightly, slightly elevated risk for their um, person or Can themselves? Yes, well, having had my husband have pericarditis last year, and I think it was COVID related, although he tested negative. Um, chest pain, shortness of breath. So similar symptoms to, to COVID itself. Usually resolves very quickly um, and usually resolves with some simple anti-inflammatory medications like Voltaren and has done, I think, in the case of the vaccine-related ones. That's pericarditis. Myocarditis, more serious, because that pericarditis is the lining around the heart. Myocarditis is the inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, so yes, there are some potentially serious complications of vaccination, but there's some really serious complications of getting COVID too. And like all these things, it's a question of, of, of balancing up the risks. It's difficult. And um, yeah, there's just a couple of follow-ups from that. If you do observe any of those symptoms, um, what should you do? And how soon after the vaccine could these symptoms present? Like, will it be straight away or, or could it be like three days down the line? Or yeah. Marguerite, do you the, the, I think it's so, uh, within about three or four days, isn't it? Yes, the that's right. So it's, it's, the, it's a few days, so around three or four days. Um, as I say, if you want to um, include that um, uh, advice, Sandra, to everybody, um, that's there. It clearly talks about symptoms uh, and says appearing mm. within the first few days. So, yeah, three or four days. And if you experience these symptoms, then the, you need basically to seek medical attention there and then. Again, like Rose is saying, don't leave a, a message on an answer phone. You, you speak to somebody, you explain what your the symptoms are and when you've had the vaccine and um, that will be treated hopefully seriously um, and should uh, again as Rosie was pointed out should be notified to to calm to the center of adverse reactions so that we can monitor these and and you know record what's going on for everybody and also I think if people feel they haven't been listened to um then they persist persist absolutely yes persist and again and again get, yeah, an get another phone somebody else call center. absolutely yeah, phone somebody else phone helpline phone somebody yep. else yeah yeah yep. thank you and just another follow-up question for that has come through is it more likely to happen after the second dose that is the current um evidence yes that it's more likely after the second dose Thank you so much for that. Awesome. We've got another couple of uh, sort of sections of questions. Um, so if it's all right with everyone, if you need to leave, obviously leave. This is being recorded, but we might just push it out just by another 10 minutes so we can answer a few more questions if that's okay with all our panellists. Awesome. So the next kind of section um, is we've had, we've had quite a few in advance. Um, obviously, Upside Downs is, a, is an organisation for children, so it's probably not surprising, but a lot of interest on uh, the trials being conducted overseas on the safety of the Pfizer vaccine in children under 12. And how far away are we realistically for, for that being an option uh, for Aotearoa? Uh, JFGI, which is what I did, which is just uh, Google it. Um, and... Pfizer claim that they are expecting to get the results of the 5 to 12 group out, um, certainly before the end of the year, maybe October, November. Um, and for the younger children, probably not that far after that. So I think it's reasonable to expect that there may be some results before the end of this year. However, we don't know what those results are going to show. And the other issue will be is that there will probably then be some further phase trials. And I suspect there will be a time of um, letting other countries go for it 
and seeing what happens because it's only really, you only get these rare things like the pericarditis popping up when you have large numbers of people being vaccinated. So, um, you know, countries like the US where they rapidly get into the millions of people being vaccinated, that's where information is going to come from. So I don't think we should anticipate that the under 12s will be getting vaccinated in New Zealand anytime soon. What do you think, Marguerite? I would agree with that. I think, um, as you say, we may be hearing um, about vaccines in other countries, perhaps by the end of the year, but then we need to watch and wait and see what follows. Yeah. Mm. A really good follow-up question as well. Um, do we happen to know if there were any children with disabilities like Down syndrome involved in the trials, or is it kind of is that are we going to have to wait and allow these other countries who are going to get their first to be the trials in that sense? I don't think we have any idea um, which children have been enrolled in the trials. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and and do you think? Do, is there a push at the moment? And do you think there could be a push um, for, from the medical profession in New Zealand to allow uh, vulnerable under 12, such as those with Down syndrome, to be prioritised with an under 12 vaccine rollout or a 5 to 12 vaccine rollout? Marguerite, what do you think on that one? Um, I don't, I'm not sure. I think... Um, as we've just said, I don't think the vaccine is is, is um, with us yet. And I think we really need to push to um, vaccinate um, all the all our over 12s first um, before we look to what the, is the situation with under 12s. Sure, once the, the vaccine is available for under 12s or if a vaccine is available for under 12s, then mm -hmm. I um, again, in the same way as we're pushing now to try and vaccinate our, our older disabled group, then yes, obviously we should then be pushing for them. But I think we need to concentrate on, on you know, the group we've got at the moment, really. Thank you. And, and just another follow up question from that. Have there been any adults with disabilities included in the trials? I know we have quite a lot of data from adults with disabilities, but I'm not sure if that's from trials or from practice. Um, do you happen to know? Don't know. Don't know yeah. an answer to that one. Can't, no. I think yeah, you shared some of that really fantastic um, data regarding people with Down syndrome specifically. Um, although that, yeah. um, cool. So the next kind of section, you know, accepting that it might be a while before under trials are able to be vaccinated. Um, this, the next couple of questions are sort of about mitigating that. So uh, one person wrote in and said they have a two-year-old with Down syndrome who has hypothyroidism and a weak respiratory system. Her older sisters are five and six and will need to return to school. What's the risk of the older siblings, who obviously will also be too young to be vaccinated, uh, bringing COVID home to the two-year-old? I presume this is in a, a world in which uh, everyone over 12 in New Zealand has been vaccinated and so we're no longer in an elimination strategy zone. Right, I'll go on that one. Um, I have actually emailed something to Sandra, which she can distribute. So I think this is really difficult and really worrying for families because um, five and five and six year old girl girls, wasn't it? You know what little girls are like. Um, they cuddle and kiss everybody, <laughs> and particularly little brothers. So this is a challenge for that family. I think. The, the advice I would give is that families need to decide that everybody who comes into contact with the vulnerable child who is eligible to be vaccinated should be. And so I would say if it was me and I had, say, um, a neighbour who refused to be vaccinated but wanted to go on, come on, go on coming to my house to have a cup of tea, I would say, sorry, if you haven't been vaccinated, you can't come here for tea. Um, I think it's worth thinking about some of the strategies which Alexia has talked about, some of the things like social stories for the older children, because after all, social stories are used with kids with disability. They're just as good for kids who don't have disability. Um, a social story about why it's important to do the social distancing, hand-washing stuff for the 
other children in the family, that for them to understand that their little brother is more vulnerable and they have to take special care of him and that's how they do it. So that would be one thing I would suggest. The other place which is a challenge is schools and early childhood centres. Um, and if I was that parent, I would be going into the school and explaining the situation. And what I would want the school to do is, first of all, to ensure that the teachers in the classes where the siblings were were fully vaccinated. And I would want them to be in a sensitive and privacy protecting way asking the school community saying we have vulnerable children in this community please do the right thing um, and I think everybody needs you know when we get out of this even if everybody gets vaccinated we still need to wash our hands and I think we're still going to be wearing masks for quite some time and I wish I could find a way of masking without my glasses misting up. But so far, it's still a, a uh, work in progress. And we need to keep up with our social distancing. And that's going to be really hard for people. So those would, that would be my advice. Anyway, I pick something to Zandra, and that can be distributed. Thank you so much. And, and yeah, we, there was also a question around kind of how do we mitigate in terms of a return to school for people? So uh, the extra challenge we'd have trying to keep masks on children with Down syndrome. This person has asked, should we be encouraging our schools to keep windows and doors open to improve ventilation? Uh, for example, are, are those the kind of things you think um, parents should maybe be encouraging the schools to consider? I think ventilation is really important. Windows open in central Otago in midwinter? Maybe not. <laughs> um, but um, up in Whangarei, where, where Bev is, probably you can have the windows open all the year round. So I think it's being sensible um, and ventilation is important. And a lot of schools are actually really poorly ventilated. No easy answers to that one. Thank you. Um, just time for another couple of quick questions. We probably won't get to all of them, but I have noted them all down. So um, we will hopefully be able to follow some of these up via email. Um, so I was wondering, and this came up in the first seminar, but it's possibly worth revisiting. Why don't you check on the length of time recommended between vaccines, particularly for young people? So this person has a son who's 15. Uh, the, the UK information is recommending eight to 12 weeks between. In New Zealand, we're doing six weeks. Um, yeah, th this did come up last time, but, but not specifically when it came to the young people, I don't think. I'm going to flick that one to Marguerite. But I can tell you, I have my first on the 21st of July. I was told to book an appointment in three weeks. And my second one will be on the 21st of September. So you can tell what I think will be good for me. But I'm not a young person anymore. Marguerite. So yes, the, you know, the, the original uh, interval was three weeks because that was what the trials were done on. Um, the information is that longer actually uh, results in a better um, immunity long term, uh, which is why people are now coming up with somewhere between six to eight weeks. But again, one of the reasons for picking the interval is not necessarily well, it's a mixture of what's what what are you aiming to do? Are you trying to get as many people vaccinated and fully covered with two doses in as short a time as possible to prevent the, the, the further spread throughout the community? Or are you working on mm -hmm. trying to give everybody as good an immunity as you can? But that may then you have to accept that that may well take eight weeks um, before people are up to um, two doses. And as you saw from Rose's slides, to, you know, the second dose really does make a huge difference. So mm. it's um, it's really a, a bit of a compromise. Uh, younger people often make better responses than older people. If you want to try and put some of a a, a take on a age take on that the question, mm. so possibly a shorter um, interval would not be as as worrying, perhaps. So you know maybe. I've got a few years on you, Rosie. Maybe my three weeks will be all right. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it doesn't, as, as long as it's more than three weeks, um, and probably somewhere aiming around six weeks is probably a good interval. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. And I think just one final question, but um, we'll, we'll endeavor to respond to those those final ones uh, via email. So if, if the person called Jay could um, private message me in the chat to your email address, we can um, try follow up with that one. But it, so just a final question um, is advice, please, on the kind of language to use around how important it is to have the vaccine without scaring or stressing the individual. I think this is such a good question because it doesn't just speak to the people in our lives uh, with disabilities or anything like that. It speaks to you know people who might be vaccine hesitant for other reasons or those kind of awkward conversations that might come up. So yeah, without saying get the vaccine or else, um, any, any advice? I think it's important to be upfront, as Bev said, about the immediate effects. So some pain at the injection site, maybe feeling a bit off color for a few days, it's really important that we are clear that those things may well happen. Things like the cardiac myopathy is so rare that I think that would be scary for people and I wouldn't be mentioning it up front, uh, particularly to a child who might be a little nervous about having the vaccine. Um, be interested to in know what Bev and Marguerite think about that. Bev, do you want to make comment? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, it, it's it's important to be honest, but um, not go into too much elaboration of every. You know, if you look if you look at any drug on um, MedSafe for the side effects, you've got about five pages of stuff. And I mean that, you know, if, and if you're really into it, you will start feeling those things too, um, because you've read them all and it, it happens. Eh? Um, so I think for the vaccines, we, we have a, the DA, the um, ministry has written a, um, a sheet that we hand out to people post vaccination sheet with common things and what to do about them, you know, like if your arms sore, put something cold over it and, you know, um, and you might feel a bit off so um but feel a bit fluey then take some pan and all that kind of thing but um i don't think it's a good idea to once again it's like i said about having the vaccine in the first place it's it's just giving kids young people or the people with, that we're talking about um information that they might feel a bit funny afterwards or they might not and, and most people seem to feel pretty okay the next day um yeah, I, I just, you know, once again, being honest, but brief <laughs> and not too scary, you know, because you know, we, we have people that drive in, you know, people without disabilities and just come in and say, well, how many people have died so far today? You know, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I really believe in being very straightforward. My answer to that is nobody. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, people are. And it, actually, we find, I, I think that amongst the general public, and I've probably vaccinated several hundred people personally, um, that a lot of people are scared. Scared of vaccines in general, scared of needles, but scared of this COVID thing because it's yeah. new and, and scary. And I mean, I, I perfectly understand that. So my way of handling it, the person at the time, is being honest and calm and matter of fact, and um, quick, <laughs> and you know, it's it's all over very quickly, and they move on and they leave smiling and laughing usually. Yeah, so and that goes for our people with disabilities yeah, as well that we've done. It's been it's been really um, what I found just you know adding a bit of personal stuff here because I have lived with my daughter for so many years and been involved with people with disabilities for so many years that for my colleagues who haven't had anything to do with any of these people before, they're quite surprised at how well they've coped with having the vaccine and have my colleagues have actually enjoyed working with them. It's been it's been really a really good learning experience for everybody, both sides. It's yeah, really good. Hope that's helpful. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, we have gone over, so we'll probably better call it there. But um, yeah, we'll follow up some of those things by email. I was I was asked to reshare the the haiku, oh, so yeah. I will do that yeah. now. Hang on, I will do that now, and I'm just going to right. Okay, so where are we? There you are. You should be able you should be able to see it now. Can you? Yep. 
lovely. Yeah. So it was actually off the Radio New Zealand website. I just found it one day. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, Sandra, should I pass over to you to, to wrap us up? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, to all our speakers, I just want to say thank you so much. I'm sure everyone has really valued all your wonderful um, insights and wisdom that you've shared with everyone. If anyone hasn't had a question and feels that they still need answering, we won't know how to contact you. So please email me or email Sarah and we will try and answer those questions for you. Um, just that sort of reminder again, please, you can go and look on our website and all the recordings will be there. So um, that's a place to go and find them. And I'm sure will be on the upside down site as well um, so that's the way to hook in and then just to say um, October is World Down Syndrome Month and we're going to be celebrating it um, in the New Zealand Down Syndrome Association so please join so that you can see what we've got um, up our sleeves so it's a big surprise but it will be something worthwhile connecting to and it's also our 40th anniversary so um, October is going to be celebration month for the New Zealand Down Syndrome Association and one of the things we'll be doing which Sarah's already um, highlighted is we're going to be doing a speech and language session so there'll be other things to do as well so please watch on the on our website and our e-news so that you can see what's happening and just finally just to all our guest speakers again thank you so much for giving up a Wednesday evening I know you've worked and you're exhausted but we really appreciate you so thank you so very much and to everyone who's joined us this evening go and have a cup of tea and enjoy your evening glass of wine whatever you're going to do <laughs> Bye. Thank you. And thank Bye. you, Sarah, for doing all the admin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.